Therapy Chat Podcast, episode 299. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. Thank you to Sunset Lake CBD for sponsoring this week's episode. Use promo code CHAT for 20% off your entire order at sunsetlakecbd.com. Sunset Lake CBD is a farmer-owned small business that ships craft CBD products directly from their farm outside of Burlington, Vermont to your door. Sunset Lake CBD has something for everyone. They offer tinctures, edibles, salves, and coffee designed to help with sleep, stress, and sore muscles. Sunset Lake CBD customers support regenerative agriculture that preserves the health of the land and creates meaningful employment in the community. Farm workers are paid a living wage and employees own the majority of the company. Remember, use promo code CHAT to get 20% off your entire order at sunsetlakecbd.com. Hey everyone, it's me, Laura Reagan. Just wanted to make sure that you know about what I've got going on this summer. I don't think I've really talked about it much here, which is silly, but in case you didn't hear, I did start a second podcast called Trauma Chat which is really for anyone who wants to understand what trauma is and how it shows up in our lives. As you've heard me say, if you've listened to this show, I've mentioned a million times that people tend to think that trauma is something that happens to someone else, something horrific and unthinkable, unspeakable. And that is true. Trauma is that. But it's also experiences that are very commonly shared among many of us, most of us. On Trauma Chat, I break down what trauma is in hopefully understandable language that's not stigmatizing. I know I couldn't have possibly captured every thought there is about trauma and every aspect of trauma and how it shows up, but I hope that trauma chat will be helpful to people who really don't understand what trauma is and maybe wondering, do I have trauma, you know, or wanting to better understand what someone they care about is going through. And most importantly, how to get help if you have experienced trauma, what to look for, how to describe your experiences or how to find the words that that name what you've been through so that you can then connect with whatever type of resource support, whether it's therapy or a podcast that you'd like to listen to, to learn more about it or an article, another website. This is my hope in creating trauma chat. And the second part of that is the new trauma therapist network community that I'm creating. It's unbelievable to say this because I've been laboring behind the scenes to bring this to you for a long time, starting in around 2018 is when I first had the idea. And then the process of getting from there to here has been slow and with many twists and turns. But I'm creating a community for people who have experienced trauma to find help for trauma therapists to find other trauma therapists to network with and refer to and gather and collaborate and share ideas and hopefully come together in person in in gatherings that I don't know if they'll be able to happen in 2021, but maybe by 2022, we can have in-person gatherings of trauma therapists to provide support to one another and combat the isolation of trauma work. Even if you work in a large agency or group practice, trauma work is so isolating. It's just part of the nature of it. And connecting with other people who get it is so valuable. The participants in my trauma therapist consult groups share how useful they find them to be 
because we're in our offices doing our work and then we go home and it can be really hard to receive the same kind of support that you give to your clients. So I hope that Trauma Therapist Network will be a useful resource for you, whether you are someone who's trying to find more information about trauma or if you are a trauma therapist yourself. To learn more, please go to traumatherapistnetwork.com. The website is not live yet as of June 28th when I'm recording this, but it will be live by August 1st if all goes well. And hopefully there may be even a soft launch before that, a beta version. So please go to traumatherapistnetwork.com where you can find a free download and sign up to be notified as soon as it officially goes live. Whether you are a therapist or just someone who wants to learn more about trauma, there's a download there for you, (laughs) different ones for each group. And I hope that this resource that I've really created from the heart will bring healing to more people. I really want people who have experienced trauma to be able to find the right kind of support. And that's why I created the Trauma Therapist Network. I hope you will join me there. Like I said, you can get more information by going to www.traumatherapistnetwork.com where you can sign up to be notified as soon as the official website goes live, which will be in August of 2021. If you're hearing this after August 2021, go there and hopefully you will find the site and you'll see everything that it has to offer. I cannot wait. This is such a labor of love, something that I've really poured my heart into and I'm just so excited for you to see it. Thank you so much for your support. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan. And today in the 299th episode of Therapy Chat, I'm going to share a replay of an interview, two different interviews with a very treasured guest, Lisa Ferentz, LCSWC. Lisa Ferentz is a therapist in Baltimore who has been practicing for over 30 years and she specializes in complex trauma, PTSD, and dissociation. Lisa Ferentz is an incredible resource for anyone wanting to learn about trauma for several reasons. One is she has a training institute, the Ferentz Institute in Baltimore, that offers trauma certificate training programs, level one and level two that are based on expressive arts, mindfulness, parts work, and other bottom-up approaches to trauma therapy. Now that a lot of the trainings are offered online because of the pandemic, this resource is accessible to everyone, even if you can't get to Baltimore. So whether you decide to take one of the certificate program trainings or one of the day-long or two-day-long workshops that she offers, everyone I've attended, and I have the level two trauma certificate, But I've also attended a lot of other trainings through her institute, and they've all been excellent. And I think they're really well-priced. So this isn't a sales pitch, and she did not pay me to say this. This is just my genuine feeling about how much I appreciate that Lisa Ferentz and the Ferentz Institute are doing such amazing work training trauma therapists. And Lisa has a couple books that you'll hear about in the podcast, at least three books, that are amazing resources for both therapists and anyone who has struggled with behaviors and emotions that come from past traumatic experiences. So I hope you'll enjoy this episode. It's kind of a lead into episode 300, which I was going to have be a compilation of listener comments, but there haven't been any comments. So I'm trying plan B, which is to give you a list of an explanation of my favorite resources for healing from trauma, learning about trauma. Yeah, so I'm really looking forward to putting that together for you for next week's episode. So settle in for this double episode, a replay of my two past interviews with Lisa Ferentz. And you're gonna, I'm sure you're gonna find them very interesting. But I love the way she explains about how trauma is held in the body. And she really goes into detail about that. So I think it's really a great one to listen to. Hope you enjoy it. And I'll be 
back to you soon with episode 300 that I hope will be a resource for a long time to come for anybody who's looking for a bunch of information about getting help with trauma all in one place. Take care. Hi, welcome back to the podcast. My guest today is Lisa Ferentz, who is a clinical social worker in private practice specializing in helping child and adult survivors of abuse and neglect. She's also a nationally known author, speaker, trainer, and consultant. Lisa, thank you so much for being here. It is my pleasure, and thank you for having me on your wonderful podcast. Pleasure is really all mine. So, Lisa, can you tell our audience a little bit more about yourself and your work? Sure, I'd be happy to. So I've actually been in private practice for about 32 years now, and I specialize, as you said, uh, in treating adolescent and adult survivors of uh, abuse and trauma and neglect. And you know what that then means is that there are so many coping strategies that survivors use, uh, including eating disorders and uh, other addictions and acts of self-mutilation, and often they struggle in relationships, and they can present with uh, experiences of depression and anxiety. So, you know, when you say that you work with trauma, you're also then working with a lot of those other issues and presenting problems. So that's a large part of what I do. And I also have an institute in Baltimore, Maryland. We're in our ninth year. I'm very thrilled to tell you. Mm-hmm. As, and you know about it because you're one of my my most um, stellar students <laughs> who, oh, thank who, you. who've graduated <laughs> from that program. So we offer certificate programs in advanced trauma treatment. And I'm really very proud of that because it's it really is state of the art trauma treatment meaning that we talk as much about bringing in expressive modalities and working with the right hemisphere of the brain as we do talking about the more traditional kinds of talk therapy so there are uh, certificate programs in that and then we just offer lots and lots of continuing education classes individual single classes for mental health professionals so that's a one of my loves and that takes up a good amount of my time but it's quite quite joyful. And I do a lot of consulting work for clinicians, um, both in the United States and in Canada, who are working with complicated trauma cases, um, which is also great fun for me to do. And I have several books out and I'm working on the next two. So uh, a lot of great stuff. But as you know, as long as you're doing things that you're passionate about, um, you can do a lot, right? As you do. Yeah. I don't do as much as that, but um, (laughs) writing (laughs) two books at once. (laughs) Yeah. One to balance out the other is how I think about it. <laughs> well, I, I'm, um, uh, yes, I'm a huge fan of yours. And as you said, I met you through your trauma certificate program. And while I was there, um, I don't know if you remember this, but last spring, um, I remember we were in class for one or two days that week. And then two more days that week, I took a workshop that you led at the Psychotherapy Networker. Yes. I tell people this all the time. I don't know if I've said it to you, but after spending days with you in the same week. By the way, I'm sorry that you had to spend four days with me. That's a lot ah, <laughs> in was, one week. <laughs> it was wonderful. It was wonderful. And that's the thing is that I was with you for four days and you never repeated yourself. You never told the same story. You, Your energy stayed high the whole time. And I learned so many techniques for working with clients who have trauma. And I'm a fairly experienced trauma clinician myself. So you were teaching me so many more things that I didn't know, even in all of those days, never repeating the same exercise. And I was just extremely impressed with that. It says a lot about the depth of your knowledge and um, the experience you bring to training. So thank you, Laura. And you, I know you are quite experienced yourself. So that really is a high compliment coming from you. And, you know, but as I said, I've been doing this work for a long time. And I, I, I realized very early on in the process, how important it was for me to approach my clients with the mindset of really being a good student and really needing to learn from them. And um, I've been very, very blessed over the years because, you know, trauma, survivors in particular can be quite quite generous and quite gracious in terms of both letting you know when, when you're doing something that's effective and letting you know when you're screwing up. Mm-hmm. So um, I have I've really have learned so much from, from my clients over the years. And, you know, it's important if you're in this field, it's important to read state-of-the-art stuff and go to conferences. And, you know, this I always say this is such a thrilling and exciting time to, to be a trauma specialist. Uh, but it's also difficult because we're just now beginning to make these incredible connections between trauma and what we're learning about the brain. 
and the yeah. impact, you know, the impact the trauma has on the brain. And we're just beginning to learn about those more expressive modalities that, that really are so critically important. So, you know, even though I've been in the field a long time, I too am constantly going to conferences and trainings because there's just so much new stuff out there, which also makes it fun, you know, and keeps it really, keeps it really alive and interesting for all of us in the field. That's true. It's such an interesting work to do and all of the new developments that are happening really make it even more exciting. Yeah. Yep. So talking about your trauma certificate programs, um, something that was really profound for me in the program was you taught us as clinicians to be checking in with our bodies during sessions. Right. Can you talk more about sort of working with the body in trauma therapy, both as for clinicians and with clients? Sure. I think it's such a great question that you're asking because it really is kind of the newest way that we have to both work with clients, as you suggest, but also to help us as clinicians really be able to be more mindful and more aware and track our own countertransferential experiences. Because no matter how you know, much of a veteran you are in this field, there's no question that there are lots and lots of very emotionally loaded moments that we have with clients. And we're certainly listening at times to very toxic and difficult trauma narratives. And so it's so important that we have what I call a dual awareness where we're both simultaneously aware of what's happening for our clients and asking them many, many times in the course of a session to pause and to really look within and to notice what they're feeling in that moment on their bodies. Because I think the body is such a critical compass and a guide for both the client and the clinician in terms of understanding, you know, are they fully present versus dissociative? Do they feel grounded? Are they aware? of their body? Are they aware of their surroundings? Um, are they having a body memory, which can often happen when people are talking about trauma, which can then lead to, you know, again, feelings of dissociation, or it can create an exacerbation of, of anxiety, or um, just a state of being flooded and overwhelmed. So it's really important that we're often asking our clients in the course of a session, not just how they're doing, but how they're doing in terms of the experiences and the sensations that they're feeling on their bodies. And at the same time, for the clinicians who are doing this really challenging and difficult work, we have to have that second awareness of right now as I'm listening to this client disclose a very difficult, a very painful, very moving trauma experience, what's happening on my body? Am, am I grounded? Am I present? Do I have an awareness of my body? Um, and using our bodies as a way to be more grounded. So very simply, like just remembering as clinicians to put, to keep both feet on the floor. And I, I tell clients the same thing because, you know, oftentimes in session, if clients begin to get triggered or overwhelmed, they will kind of go into a constricted or a collapsed body posture. They'll often literally go into a kind of fetal position where they'll tuck their legs under underneath them. And that's a really important indicator to the clinician that that client is really not fully present anymore. Mm. Um, and so having the client pay attention to body sensation really can help keep them present and aware. And it can keep us present and aware. You know that one of the things I always say in the trauma program is that someone's got to be grounded and present at all times. And it better be the therapist. Yes, right? I love that. Right? Because it's not always the client. Yeah. Um, now, you and your listeners may notice that as I talk about this, I say on your body. Mm -hmm. what, I re what I mean is in your body. But Laura, one of the things that I learned from my sexual abuse survivors was that the phrase in your body actually felt quite triggering to them. Mm -hmm. it, it had an association with invasion or penetration or violation of some kind. And so I've learned to, to kind of make that less triggering by saying uh, what's happening on your body. Clients know, you know, that we're really talking about in your body. Yeah. Um, but, but framing it as on your body, I have found is a little bit less threatening. And, and just to be even more specific with you and with your listeners, what we're really asking our clients and ourselves to track is, is what's called the vasal vagal zone. So not to get technical, but if you start at the top of your head, Head and you just notice and track what 
what's the sensation in your forehead? Is there tension? Is it relaxed? What's happening with your eyes? Is there tension in your jaw? And then you just sort of move straight down. What are you noticing in your throat? Is there constriction or tightness there? What do you feel on your chest? And really traveling all the way down to the pit of the stomach. We know that about 85% of what we feel emotionally gets housed in that zone. Mm. So that's really where we're wanting to bring our clients' attention and where we're wanting to have our own awareness in terms of tracking whether or not we're triggered and and how forward and and present we are versus how dissociative we are. The other reason why working with the body is so important is because people like Bessel van der Kolk, who's really one of the forefathers of, of you know, understanding trauma treatment in our field now has been able to show through PET scans and functional MRIs that trauma is stored viscerally, meaning on the body, as well as visually. And that's part of why clients often will have flashbacks about their trauma experiences. And it's why they'll often present with what we call somatization, which means physical pain. So it's very, very common for people who have a prior history of physical abuse or sexual abuse to hold those experiences literally on their bodies. And the byproduct of that is that they have chronic migraines and they have a lot of GI and stomach upset and they have a lot of um, limb pain and and just incredible feeling of fatigue. Fibromyalgia is a really common diagnosis with folks who have experienced trauma. So it's for those reasons, it's important that we're really paying attention to the body because so much of their past traumatic experiences really get stored there and, and kind of stuck on the body. Wow. Thank you for explaining that. For so many clients who've experienced trauma, um, when you ask what emotions come up when they're discussing something, oftentimes the, it's, uh, there's nothing. I think it's a really great point that sometimes as therapists, when we ask throughout what they think or what they feel, they can get stuck and they're, and they're not able to articulate that. So if instead we're asking them, take a moment and notice, you know, is there any sensation anywhere on your body? And, and really guide them, you know, take them through that vasal vagal zone. So are you noticing any tension in, on your face or in your head or your jaw? your throat, you know, what are you feeling on your chest and your belly? That's often a way into then finding the verbal narrative. So what you were really just talking about was what Bessel van der Kolk and Dan Siegel and other people are talking about as working from the bottom to the top, meaning starting with the body and then having that flow into verbal narrative and words rather than starting with words and hoping that that's going to connect to emotion and body sensation. So this is, as you know, this is a very different way to work with trauma. And in our field now, when people, agencies and private practitioners talk about doing trauma-informed care, that's really what they should be talking about when they allude to that. They're, you know, If they genuinely are doing trauma-informed care, it means that they understand the importance of bringing the body into the process. And, and also what that means is, is, and we all are guilty, we all did this in the old days, myself included, it's about no longer having a client do a 50-minute monologue about their trauma narrative in a kind of frozen position, right? Yeah. It's actually having clients move as they talk about their trauma so that all that energy that's been um, sort of bound up on the body and truncated on the body can be literally released. So as hokey as it sounds, now those of us who work with trauma, when we're having clients share a painful experience, we're often having them stand up and walk in the office back and forth or move their arms or and this is actually very spontaneous and natural it's not it's not imposing movement on the clients it's really us watching and tracking how their bodies move and then inviting the client to continue with that movement to amplify that movement and make it even bigger and then attach words to the movement because there's there's part of the trauma narrative is in that movement as well. So you've talked about working with trauma in the body or on the body mm -hmm. and, um, <laughs> and using movement. Can you talk about how you use expressive arts in trauma sure, therapy? Sure, sure. So I had said a little while ago that what we know now is that trauma is stored 
viscerally on the body. The second place where we know that trauma is stored is visually. And so what that has taught us as trauma specialists is that one of the best ways that we can help our clients to reconnect with and reaccess experiences that have kind of gone underground, you know, for safety reasons. One of the ways that we can begin to gently help them reconnect with memory and emotion and experience is visually. And very simplistic art therapy-based strategies uh, can be a great way to open that door. So just to give you a couple of examples, if a, if you're sitting with a client and you're asking them to tell you something about their past and they say, you know, I, I know stuff happened, but, and I have this sort of feeling about it, but I don't really have words for it. That actually becomes a really nice opportunity for a therapist to introduce a more visually based modality. So inviting a client to think in terms of shape, line, and color, those are kind of the simple simplest ways to introduce art therapy into the session, I will often say to the client, you know, it's perfectly okay that, that you can't really verbally talk about an emotion, something that you're feeling. Let's see if maybe you can visually depict it. And again, just using shape, line, and color, think about what color or colors that feeling might be. Think about the shape or shapes that might in some way, um, you know, illustrate the emotion that, that you're feeling. And it's quite extraordinary how, how easy it really is for clients to kind of take that ball and run with it. So just inviting them to draw emotion, inviting, inviting them to draw body sensation uh, before they can kind of decode it and talk about it verbally. There are certainly lots of clients out there who don't feel comfortable with art and don't feel comfortable drawing. And that's a pretty normal actual, uh, actually, that's a pretty normal response. And so the other modality that I use a lot is collaging. So that's where we just have lots of different, different kinds of magazines in the office. And rather than having the client draw something, you know, which can be frustrating if a client doesn't feel like that, you know, that they're a good artist. I just literally have them look through different magazines and I invite them to choose images and words in the magazines that might, again, speak for whatever it is that we're working on, a memory, a feeling, uh, an experience that they had that they don't, maybe they don't yet want to talk about it, but they want a way of showing us some aspect of their narrative so that, so that frankly, we can be compassionate witnesses to their experience. So collaging is really easy for clients. And then you have them cut out or rip out the words and the images and they can spend the whole session really doing this and deciding where they want words and images to be in relation to each other and then pasting them, you know, on, on paper. And then you've got this really concrete, tangible piece of work that not only in that session, but certainly in many subsequent sessions, you and the client can, can revisit and process. And it's, it's actually quite fascinating how each time a client, at least I find this anecdotal, Anecdotally, that each time a client goes back and revisits a piece of art that they've done, they attach new meaning to it. You know, they gain more insight about it. And so it's, it's, it's a great tool that you can continually revisit. And the other um, modality that I use a lot is sand tray. I'm just such a huge, huge fan of sand tray work. And for people, for your listeners who, who are not familiar with it, it's, it's a big tray that literally has, but it's very specific kind of sand. It's very soft. So texturally, it feels very soothing and, and comforting for clients. And then you have all kinds of different little figures, animals and people and objects, and you invite the client to create sand scenes. And that this becomes another visual kind of nonverbal way that they can either share a memory with us or process an emotion. And again, quite remarkable how deep clients can go in, in terms of interpreting once they've put the objects in the sand. And we're always curious about where objects are in relation to each other. I think that holds a lot of meaning for clients. The one important caveat, Laura, that I want to make about using any art based modality is the importance of not interpreting the art for your client, mm. you know, but because art is such a projective thing that when, when clinicians, you know, really well-intended clinicians n begin to go down that road of interpreting their client's art, they're actually giving the client information about them, about the client, <laughs> about the clinician, because it's so projective. So all that matters is just inviting the client to be curious about the meaning that they want to attach to the art that they've created. 
And that's what you go with, not, you know, the clinician's interpretation. In, in many of the trainings I give, I show a lot of clients' artwork. And it's always amazing how I can have 50 clinicians in the room and I can get 20 different interpretations of the mm-hmm. same piece of art, you know, because it because it really is going through everybody's subjective filter. So I think that's that's a, an important word of caution if, if, uh, if you're going to incorporate these modalities, which I hope you do because they're so powerful and I think they're really quite necessary – given that so much of the trauma is stored visually, it's important to really let the client take the lead and let the client interpret at their own pace, in their own way, the meaning that they want to attach to their work. Thank you for adding that point because I know it's very tempting to be like, oh, that's your dad. and Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what exactly. you're really saying as a therapist is that's my dad. and <laughs> <laughs> There you go. That's it. That's it. And, you know, sometimes we're right. Sometimes the work is obvious. But I have to tell you, more of the time we're wrong. Mm. And, and that's why it's so important that we really just – you know, get very humble about it and, and, and truly trust that the interpretation that the client is giving us, that's the one we want to work with. That's the one we want to go with. Absolutely. So Lisa, um, another thing that I admire about you is your perspective on borderline personality disorder. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about, um, how you understand that? Sure. Um, I think, and, and for some of your listeners, uh, you know, this may completely resonate. And I also really respect that for some of your listeners, particularly clinicians out there, what I'm about to say might feel very dissonant uh, because it's really not the mainstream perspective that I'm, that I'm going to offer. Um, and I believe very, very strongly that borderline personality disorder is a death sentence in the mental health field. I, I think it automatically puts a glass ceiling on the extent to which the therapist believes the client can get better. And it often even creates a lack of hope and some pessimism for, for more educated clients who hear that diagnosis. And I think even they understand all of the connotations that go with it. And unfortunately, in our field, those connotations include things like this is going to be a very difficult client. He or she is going to be very high maintenance. They're probably not going to get that much better. Um, they're going to be very high risk. They're probably going to do a lot of, you know, suicidal gesturing and acting out. And, um, you know, therapy's not going to get very far. And right from the get go, I, I really think therapists, whether they're conscious of it or not, when they're presented with a client who has that diagnosis, already the level of, of hope and optimism has dramatically decreased. So what I believe instead is that anybody who has the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder is in, in actuality a trauma survivor. And and Laura, what I, what I find amazing, because I do this little experiment in the United States, in Canada, and, and in England, where all the places where I train, when I ask, you know, the audience of clinicians, Tell me honestly, what's your reaction when you're, when you're presented with a case and you're told she's borderline or he's borderline? And it, there's a universal reaction of literally sitting back in their chairs, shaking their heads no, uh, uncomfortable laughter, and basically people saying, you know, I don't want that client. I'm, I'm booked. I'm busy. You know, I don't have room in my caseload. When I then say to audiences around the world, well, if you got a phone call and you were, you were asked, could you please, please help this client? I know you could help her. Please make time in your practice. She's a trauma survivor. The shift in response is so palpable. You see people very spontaneously. It's quite amazing. Clinicians very spontaneously putting their hand over their heart. Mm. They nod their head yes. You see this warm smile. And I think it's because in our field, trauma survivor evokes a very empathic and compassionate response. And borderline evokes an almost angry, certainly frustrated response. And so in fairness to clients and, and frankly, in fairness to therapists as well, because you don't want there to be a glass ceiling on, on the extent to which you believe a client can heal. I tell the folks that I train, when you hear borderline, think trauma survivor, mm -hmm. be because really that's what it is, right? We know that with borderline, so much of what drives that diagnosis is the ambivalence that they feel about attaching both to their therapist and, and to other people in their lives. They, they desperately want the connection and the attachment, and yet their template for relationship is getting close equals getting hurt right. because, right? Because that's really 
what happened to them. So that's that's the dance of attachment, of, of traumatized attachment or disorganized attachment that manifests in what we call borderline. But I just think we'll get so much. I know that we get farther with these folks when we can hold that compassion that we seem to just very inherently have when we talk about trauma and when we talk about insecure attachment. And so, yes, I travel around the world, you know, on my soapbox, really discouraging mental health professionals from stamping that diagnosis on their clients' charts. I agree with you. I tell people that borderline personality disorder is a diagnosis that just describes behavior of people who experience childhood trauma. Good. You know? Good. Yes. So right. why not just give the diagnosis that actually fits yeah. The, yeah. the cause rather than just the behavior that results from something terrible having happened so long before? Exactly right. I have I had a colleague who years ago, I wish I could remember her name to give her credit for this. I, I thought this was a brilliant uh, way in which she distinguished it after she heard me say what I just said to you. She raised her hand in the audience. She said, I think what you're saying is that we should think about borderline as an adjective and not a noun. And, you know, I, right. I thought that was such a brilliant way to, to conceptualize it because if we think about borderline as noun, then we're saying this is who the person is, as opposed to what you just said, which is this is a, a shorthand way in the mental health field to talk about some of the behavioral manifestations of trauma rather than she is borderline, right? Which becomes a sort of all-encompassing uh, identity and diagnosis for the client. So yeah, thinking of it behavioral, I think makes, makes a whole lot more sense. Yeah. And I have, um, I've definitely had the experience of clients coming to me who had been in therapy before and they say, you know, my other therapist said I have borderline traits. What do you think? And I say, well, the first thing I think is how shameful they seem to feel about yes. being told that. Yeah. You know, how shaming that is. And I, I just say what I said before, like, I don't, I don't diagnose, I don't use that diagnosis. It just doesn't resonate for me. I work with people who've experienced trauma and, you know, when you feel powerless, you find other ways to communicate, you know, it's not, I'm not going to label people with that diagnosis. So I love that you're out there telling people that because feel like it gives me a little more <laughs> oomph in yes. my... <laughs> yes, listen, you, you, said. <laughs> you have it right. You have it right. And, and I, I love that you get it. Um, you know, and even if we uh, just educate one clinician at a time, yeah. I, I think it, I think it makes a really significant difference. I really like that you pointed out the shame that's associated with that diagnosis. I think you're a hundred percent right about that. And you know me, and you know my work. So much of the way that I work is about depathologizing yes. clients. I'm so interested in what's right with them rather than what's wrong with them. And uh, I think borderline absolutely does shame, and it does keep. The, the focus on what's wrong with the client. And I know you and I work in very similar ways and we're both very interested in really assessing for a client's resiliency and their strengths and their creativity. And, you know, borderline doesn't let you do that. You know, yeah. it, 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 it really keeps the focus in a very pathologizing place and in a very negative place. And, um, so yeah, you get it, I get it. And, um, hopefully for the folks who are listening, you know, they can take this to heart. It, I'll tell you, it really makes a difference for us as therapists because, when I let go of that, and again, in 32 years, I've never once given anybody that diagnosis, and I never will. And trust me, there are tons of psychiatrists who could look at my caseload and said, oh, say, you've worked with 100 borderlines in your career. But I've never, ever once given that diagnosis because I don't want to in any way put a ceiling on my sense of hope about the client. You know, I, I don't want to buy into the idea that, well, there's a limit to how much better this client can really get because – in terms of therapy and the efficacy of therapy, what we know is it's really not so much about the treatment modality. It's really about two things, the therapeutic relationship and the hope that the therapist brings into that process. And so if a particular diagnosis is going to in some way compromise the therapist's sense of hope, you know, nobody benefits from that. Exactly. That's so well said. So um, your books. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know all of your books. I'm thinking about, I believe, your most recent books about working with self-destructive behaviors. Right, right. 
So currently I have two books out that I, I, I'm very, very excited about because they're not, they're different. They're not kind of, again, the mainstream thinking about how to work with self-destructive behavior. So the first book that I wrote that's now in its second edition is called Treating Self-Destructive Behavior in Trauma Survivors, A Clinician's Guide. And really much of what you and I were just talking about is the underpinning of that book. It's a very strengths-based, deep pathologized approach to working with any form of self-destructive behavior. And again, that includes things like eating disorders and and acts of self-mutilation, any addictive behavior, uh, addictive relationships. So it's this, it's look, it's really reframing those behaviors as a form of communication, as a way that clients attempt to self-medicate and cope. And it is in no way connected to borderline personality disorder. It is connected to trauma. Mm -hmm. So that's the book that I wrote for clinicians. And in fact, the last third of that book, Treating Self-Destructive Behavior in Trauma Survivors, is really about self-care for the clinician. Because as you well know, these can be very complicated and, and complex cases. And it's so important that clinicians don't lose sight of the need to do a whole lot of self-care when they're working with people who are doing you know, behaviors that actually can feel scary to the clinician. You know, you have a client who comes in and says, I'm cutting. Understandably, that can evoke anxiety and and fear and, and upset on the part of the therapist. So we need to, again, it's kind of cool, Laura, this brings us full circle, mm-hmm. that we need to be very grounded. We need to be very present as therapists when we work with those issues. And uh, we need to do a lot of self-care. So that's the book that I wrote for clinicians. And then Two years after that, I wrote uh, the book that was really kind of my dream book, and that was a workbook called Letting Go of Self-Destructive Behavior, a workbook of hope and healing, and that's for lay people. Now, those two books are actually meant to be sort of companion books to each other, um, so they're cross-referenced a lot for the clinician. But the the book Letting Go of Self-Destructive Behavior, I also wrote for for folks who might not have access to mental health resources. You know, there are millions of people in more rural areas who cannot, I mean, the closest mental health professional is 100 miles away. And so I really wanted to write a book that could give folks the opportunity to depathologize their destructive behaviors, help them make sense out of their behaviors, help to connect their behaviors to a prior history of trauma, abuse, neglect, or some kind of pain narrative that I think has happened in their lives, and then give them lots and lots of hope. Um, Give them lots of strategies, concrete tools and strategies to help them regulate and self-soothe in ways other than doing their self-destructive behavior. So um, it's been very exciting, actually, because the feedback is just very humbling and very wonderful from people all around the world who, who are using the workbook and, and, and say, you know, for the first time, I, I've let go of my shame, which you and I have talked about is so important. Mm-hmm. And, um, I fe- you know, here's the thing that I often say to family members as well as to folks who are struggling with self-destructive behaviors, you actually cannot expect a person to give up their self-destructive behaviors until you give them new tools and new ways to accomplish accomplish what their eating disorder was doing for them, you know, or what getting high or, or, uh, or cutting was doing. Because the truth is, even though it's sometimes it's hard for, for significant others to believe this, people do these behaviors because they get something from the behavior. So in order for them to really let go of the behavior, we need to give them other ways to, again, self-soothe and regulate and, and communicate their pain narratives. And that's what this workbook does for them. So thank you for allowing me to talk about it. It's something I'm very excited about. And people can get those books either on Amazon um, I also, if it's okay, I want to let people know about my website because there's a lot of free resources there. Yes, please. Including access to my two books. And it's just very simple. It's just lisaferrance.com. So I'm going to spell it because I know Ferrance sounds weird on the radio um, or over the air. So it's L-I-S-A and then it's F as in Frank, E-R-E-N as in Nancy, T as in Tom, Z as in Zebra. So lisaferrance.com. And people can, for free, they can access my blogs. They can access archives of my radio show. They can certainly access the books. Um, So yeah, we want people to have... 
resources. And that's why I love what you're doing too, you know, is it's, you understand it's so much about educating, right? Um, because that's what takes away the shame. That's what gives people back a sense of hope. And so the more resources and tools we can give people to educate them that what they're doing makes sense and what they're doing probably is connected to unresolved pain or trauma. And that as they work in the direction of resolving that pain, a lot of the other, quote, symptoms, which I, for me are really creative coping strategies, but a lot, of, a lot of those symptoms that, you know, cause shame and create other problems begin to dissipate. So we, we want to give people lots of tools to educate them. Yes. And I imagine it's very empowering for someone to find that workbook and see a different understanding of, oh, I'm not, you know, you know, so often people who've experienced trauma um, when they contact someone for therapy, they'll say, you know, I just really think something's wrong with me. And I think trauma makes you feel that way. So right. for people who don't have access to therapy or they're not ready to reach out yet to pick up your workbook and see that, oh, like this makes sense. I'm not weird. Like this actually, what I'm doing makes sense. And there's a way to find something maybe more effective that I can do that will really sort of meet the need that I'm trying to meet. You know, well said, exactly. And I think what happens for folks who are doing self-destructive behavior, and again, this is something that we all have to really be sensitive to and respect and understand, is that in the short term, those behaviors work. You know, in in the short term, there's there is an immediate sense of relief. There is a distraction away from other pain. There is um, the experience of numbing. There is the release of endorphins, which are actually opiates. You know, that our brains release that make us temporarily feel better. But in the long term, see, that's not the end point, right? The end point then is going to be guilt and shame and um, anxiety and fear about, you know, my family's going to be mad at me or my therapist is going to fire me or yeah. I, pro I promised myself I wouldn't do this again and now I've done it again. So, you know, it's it, the stuff that they're doing does work in the short term. It's just the end game always is a place of guilt and shame, feeling worse about themselves, which actually then sets them up to keep doing the self-destructive behavior because when you hate yourself, it resonates to hurt yourself. So yeah. we want to give them tools that, that accomplish what, you know, cutting accomplishes without that end point of guilt or shame. That's the difference. Yeah, I love that. And for clinicians, the book really is... I think when clients are cutting, sometimes clinicians can feel really worried and overwhelmed and not know, how do I make this person stop? How do I make this yeah. person stop? You know, and yes. um, with your book for clinicians, I think that there's a kind of a like light in the darkness there to help us understand. Yeah. You know, first of all, it's not me trying to make someone stop doing something. It's understanding the behavior and helping that client understand and find better ways to cope. Exactly. I, it's a great point you're making because I, I think, again, folks who are working with these behaviors uh, get anxious, get intimidated, get worried. And you're right. I think what happens in therapy is that the agenda becomes the therapist and not the clients that, you know, from their own place of anxiety, the therapist can get actually pretty aggressive mm -hmm. about, you know, sort of quote, forcing the client to give up behaviors. But again, if they're, if they're making, you know, I'll only see you contingent upon if you stop doing what you're doing, sooner or later, some other self-destructive behavior is going to pop up because you've neglected to give the client other resources, other tools, uh, other ways to, um, you know, to be calm and to self-soothe and, and, and to work through your trauma. So, yeah, be, you know, just sort of forcing people, which is why just as an aside, I mean, I know you, you know this about me, but I, I'm very opposed to standard safety contracts because I think they set up power struggles between the therapist and the client and they don't really work. I mean, they really don't work. I can tell you anecdotally years and years and years ago when I was trained to do standard safety contracts and, you know, clients would very reluctant, reluctantly and begrudgingly sign them. And then they would come into session the next week and say, oh, guess what? I cut myself three more times last week. 
And that's all about a power struggle that I inadvertently created by forcing them to sign something that, you know, they were not ready to sign and didn't resonate for them. So in my book, I give clinicians an alternative to standard safety contracts so that, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not leaving them without a resource. I'm just saying, you know, forcing your, your clients to sign something, it just, it really doesn't work. And I've gotten so much feedback from so many clinicians around the country that, that really echo that idea that, yeah, you know, you're right. Standard safety contracts really don't work. Yeah. Yeah. And it's nice to know that with your books, that there are some other ways that maybe feel better to the clinician and certainly feel better to the client. Yeah. Yep. That's the goal. Yeah. So Lisa, what other programs and trainings do you have going on that you want people to know about? Um, I want people to know about our institute, which again is in Baltimore. And um, it, that gives CEUs to clinicians, all mental health professionals who are either in the state of Maryland and Washington, D.C. and Virginia and West Virginia. And one of the really fun things is that we offer really good ethics trainings. I know that sounds like an oxymoron to say that <laughs> that ex ethics trainings can be fun, but we really do make it fun. Um, we bring in a lot of clips from movies and TV, uh, episodes, uh, shows like The Sopranos and In Treatment, and those become fabulous teaching tools, frankly, to, to, to talk about what not to do, mm -hmm. right, <laughs> as a therapist, because, you know, psychotherapy is, is often depicted, you know, in such negative ways and, and inappropriate ways. So our ethics classes, you know, we get wonderful feedback that they're really, really fun. I think all the trainings that I, I'm very, I cherry pick my speakers. They're, they're just phenomenal teachers as well as being excellent clinicians. And so I do want people to, to check out the, the Institute. And again, through my website, lisaferens.com, they can, uh, that, that will take them to a calendar of all the continuing education that we offer at the Institute. And I also do provide a lot of consultation to therapists who are working with more complicated cases. And those might be cases that involve, as we've already talked about, self-destructive behavior. Uh, that might include cases of DID, dissociative identity disorder, because those certainly can be complex and challenging cases. And that happens to be one of my areas of expertise. So I love doing the consulting work. It's great. It's great fun. Again, on my website are all the ways that my contact information and my email address. So people can access me if they, if they just want, you know, another sort of objective pair of eyes in terms of managing some of their more difficult cases. And... I don't know. I'm, that's enough, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, um, I would like you to say that you have the trauma certificate level one and trauma certificate level two programs. So people can know in addition to your, sure. you know, individual stuff. Right, right. So, and again, Laura is one of our um, best examples of uh, of a grad of a grad. Truly, I really mean that. I I, I I remember you so well, and I remember the insightful questions that you asked throughout the trainings. And um, so, yes, we have level one, which I am I, I've created, and I'm the course master for that for that. And it's nine classes over four months, so it works out to be about twice a month. And we also have then level two, which where I bring in uh, other experts, an art therapist and um, somebody who has tons of experience with psychodrama and somebody who has over 30 years of experience doing sand tray work and um, movement. And I do a two day training in parts work and visualization and guided imagery. And it, level two is great fun. It's, it's very, very ex highly experiential. Um, and so for, for people out there who are working in agencies or working as private practitioners, and you understand that now in our field, there really is this push to do, quote, trauma-informed care, I can tell you with, with a surety that these certificate programs really, really embrace, fully embrace that concept of trauma-informed care, teaching you how to work bottom-up, teaching you how to incorporate the body and the expressive modalities, helping you to understand in very simplistic and straightforward ways the impact that trauma has on the brain. 
um, putting trauma, putting our clients into a family of origin context so that we really trace both the development and as well as the impact that trauma has on development for our clients, you know, as they go through the developmental phases in life. So I'm very proud of it. And I've graduated close to 700 clinicians now. Wow. Yeah. And there's, you know, I, I keep hearing, I, I don't know that I knew this necessarily, but I do keep hearing from, from people out there that there's not a lot of programs across the country, mm. you know, that, that have this kind of focus on truly doing trauma-informed care. So I'm very proud of that. And um, I'm very delighted that there are over 700 folks out there who are talking the talk and walking the walk and, you know, doing the work in a way that, that really brings true healing to, to clients. Because we do have that responsibility, you know, to do the work in a way that is safe. We need to understand how to, how to contain clients and not flood them, not emotionally overwhelm them. Uh, we need to know how to incorporate working with the body. We need to understand the impact that the trauma has on them developmentally. And so, you know, that's our obligation as, as trauma specialists. And the more we do that, the more effective the work is and the, the, the more safely the work unfolds for our clients. And, uh, you know, m my passion is making sure that trauma therapy does not re-traumatize. And I think that we we owe that to our clients to make sure that what we're doing is not re in, inadvertently, certainly we would never intentionally, but inadvertently not re-traumatizing our clients. Yeah. And I can attest that the trauma certificate program, the level two that I took is top notch. And I heard from everyone who was in level one, how wonderful that was too. But also there's a huge number of CEUs for each level. Yes, 54. So there you go. You get you get more than 2 years worth of CEUs yeah. in 4 months. You're right. And and listen, I you know, clinicians really like that because our time is limited and um my feeling is that, you know, rather than just grabbing CEUs wherever you can, if you can commit to a program that really gives you a lot of depth and at the same time gives you lots and lots of CEUs, I, yeah, that's that's a win-win for clinicians. You know what's really cool, Laura? This has happened um particularly this semester. We had not only did we overfill the amount of students because oh, I that's great because I really do try to keep it somewhat intimate so not only do we have over 40 students but I had a waiting list of 27 additional wow clinicians. Right. So I could have had 67, which I don't do because again, I want to keep it intimate. But the reason why that's happening, and I'm really, really thrilled about this is because I'm seeing this wonderful trend where supervisors are sending their entire staff. Oh, um, that's great. Right? And I love that because I think that, that when an entire staff comes and gets this kind of training, it truly changes the culture of the whole organization. And so that's kind of the newest trend that I'm really, really thrilled about that it's not just, you know, one brave soul who comes to this program and then comes back and, you know, kind of speaks a different language in a mm -hmm. way, right, from the rest of their colleagues. But this semester, I've got two wonderful agencies and they've each brought, one has brought 14 staff and the other has bought, brought 10. And wow. it's completely changing the culture of how they're working. So I love that. I'm very excited about that. And so I do encourage supervisors and folks who run agencies to really consider making that investment of, you know, it doesn't have to be all at the same time, but kind of over time, because, you know, I'm going to be doing this till I'm 95. I'm, I'm not going anywhere. I hope so. <laughs> so allowing, you know, many, many of their clinicians to, to go through the program, because then it really does again, completely change the culture of how they're working with their clients. That's amazing. Thinking about how if an agency is, you know, focused on wanting to become trauma informed, yeah. instead of just sending one supervisor and then hoping that they'll be able to teach, you know, everybody who works under them, yeah. Just bring in the whole group. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Yeah, it's a good model because so much of what we do is experiential that even when you have, a, and I know people do this and it's fine, mm -hmm. you know, the supervisor comes in and then they go back and report what they learned, but the, what they're missing, what the rest of the group is missing is is just the experiential piece of it So because I think learning ha can happen on many, many levels. So it's not just talking about an art therapy technique, it's having the chance to to play with that technique in the program so that you can 
can really experience firsthand how this works and why it works. And um, so that's something that you have to be in the program, obviously, you mm-hmm. know, to, to really get. Yes. Yeah, some of the things that we learned in the program, I remember thinking, oh, I've heard about this activity before, mm-hmm. you know, oh, this is kind of basic. And then as I did it, I had this profound experience and I'm like, Wow. <laughs> yeah. Right. And that's what we hear over and over. You know, it's it's like when you when you're willing to kind of access that creative part of yourself and and really participate on a deeper level, you you just get it on such a deep level. And then you can communicate it differently when you bring it back to therapy. You know, when you when you kind of hold your client's hand through that process of working creatively, um, you just you get it as a clinician because you've you've done it. You know, yeah. it's it, it's not just from the neck up, right? Exactly. And again, clients appreciate that. They say, you know, I know you can take me there because, you know, you've done this. Like yeah. when yeah. we talk about, you know, I'll say I tried this new technique and it was really amazing. I think it's going to be really powerful and, you know, sort of being a little vulnerable with them. And then they're like, you tried it. I'm willing to try it. And and then they'll have this great experience. Right. I, I really like what you're saying. It, it's sort of like you have to endorse it first, <laughs> right? And then the client will find the courage, you know, to to try it as well. Yeah. You're walking with them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Lisa, it's been such a pleasure to have you on today. Thank you so much for giving me your time. Oh, it's my, listen, you're a wonderful interviewer. You, you make Thanks. it so easy. <laughs> So thank you. And thank you again, Laura, for what you're doing. I I think this is wonderful. And um, I hope, you know, millions and millions of people listen to all the podcasts that you've done because you have, yes, you have, (laughs) you have a lot of wisdom and you've got a lot to offer and a lot to share. So um, I, I just, I, I just hope that this keeps unfolding and, and, you know, gets amplified a thousand times over. So thank you for this wonderful contribution that you're making to our field. Oh, thank you, Lisa. Hey everybody, I wanted to take a quick minute to tell you about my experience with Sunset Lake CBD. I first tried CBD when my integrative doctor recommended it for chronic neck pain and tension that tends to wake me up at night. I really like Sunset Lake CBD's products. The full spectrum CBD tincture is mild tasting compared to others I've tried, and I find it works quickly. It doesn't feel sedating, but it does have a pleasant calming effect. And I also like the CBD gummies. They taste good and they work well. So if you're looking for a craft CBD product that comes directly from a farm outside Burlington, Vermont, that's a producer for Ben and Jerry's ice cream, you're going to want to check out Sunset Lake CBD. And remember, Therapy Chat listeners get 20% off using the promo code CHAT. So go to sunsetlakecbd.com and use the promo code CHAT. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan, and today I'm deeply honored to have a very special person returning for a second interview. I'm here with Lisa Ferentz today. Lisa, thank you so much for coming back to Therapy Chat. My pleasure to be with you. Yes, the really the pleasure's all mine. I I wanted you to come back to Therapy Chat because of course as you know, I love your work and I recommend you to everyone. But right now you have something special. You have a new book coming out or it's out now, right? It's out. Yes, about a month. Yep. So tell us about your new book and why you chose the title that you did. Let's just start with that. Sure. So the book is called Finding Your Ruby Slippers, Transformative Life Lessons from the Therapist's Couch. And as you could probably guess, the title is directly inspired by the movie The Wizard of Oz. And, you know, in the movie, Dorothy spends the whole film really trying to find her way back home. And she's convinced that the wizard has the answers. Uh, And of course, when she reaches the Emerald City, she discovers he's just a short guy behind a curtain and he doesn't have any magical powers. And although she's initially quite despondent and upset, Glinda comes down in this moment that I always thought was so beautifully metaphoric. And she basically says to Dorothy, look at your own feet. You've been wearing the ruby slippers all along. And that's always stuck with me, Laura, because I think it is such a great metaphor for this idea of inner wisdom, that we actually spend a lot of our time believing that other people have 
the answers that we need, you know, for our own healing or personal growth or even to make a, a very important life decision. And although I'm all in favor of people getting support and incorporating resources and, you know, nobody should go through life alone, I, I really do have this strong sense, and I know that you do too as a clinician, that people have this remarkable inner wisdom and that they often either don't realize it's there or they minimize it. And so the book, the theme of the book is really reminding people and then encouraging and inviting people to be able to turn inward, to find that inner wisdom for, I think, that the real answers that they need in life to be happy, to, to have inner peace, uh, to truly know what's best for them. So that, that's what inspired the title. And, and that's really the overarching theme of the book is self-empowerment and knowing that you have that inner wisdom. And I think that we can access that wisdom and work with that wisdom when we can approach it from a place of curiosity and from a place of self-compassion. So those are also kind of themes that are woven into the book as well. Wonderful. Thank you for explaining that. And I love that connection between the ruby slippers and that idea that, you know, it was really, the answers were really within you all along. I, I really think that's so powerful. Yep. You know, I do, like you said, I do believe that we all have inner wisdom and we have the strength within us to probably a lot more strength than we give ourselves credit for to heal at the same time, I'll give you credit that in training with you is where I actually began to believe in my own inner wisdom in a way that I really hadn't felt connected with it before I did your training. So that's the magic of your experiential trainings. <laughs> right. I, I, you know, that means a lot to me because I think you are such a, a phenomenal therapist and person. And I think, though, it's, it's actually a nice example of how, you know, the wisdom was obviously always there. And it's, again, it's perfectly okay and more than okay to, to let others into our life, you know, teachers. I think that we all, we all hopefully have the privilege of having many teachers in our lives. Sometimes those teachers are other clinicians or mentors. Sometimes those teachers are our clients, right? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, you know, the teachers can be books like the one that I wrote and, and many other people have written that, that just kind of give us that guidance and um, enable us to access and, and connect with what's there. I always tell my clients, I never think it's about reinventing who you are. I think it's about reconnecting with who you are. And so, you know, you came into my training and obviously the inner wisdom was already there. Uh, but if it's, a, and I believe this, that if it's a nurturing, safe relationship, environment, that helps us to be able to feel safe enough and comfortable enough to look inside. Because I, I think it is important to, to add that it is an act of vulnerability, right? To turn mm -hmm. inwards. You know, part of why I think people are so externally focused is not necessarily just because they don't realize they have that wisdom, but they also use external scenarios and relationships to serve as a distraction you know, away from themselves. And I think that sadly, it's because sometimes people don't trust that if they were to turn inward, what they would find, what they would connect with would be something that is is precious and beautiful and, and helpful and, and, and meaningful. You know, I think a lot of the clients that you and I work with, when they come from trauma or they come from dysfunctional families of origin, uh, they don't they don't trust that turning inward is going to yield something positive. And so they do spend a lot of their lives distracting through chaotic relationships or, you know, crisis driven workplace environments. And so I think that people sometimes need that reassurance that no matter what they've been through and no, and no matter, you know, how much trauma is there, I, I still believe that there's this internal resource that that is truly wise, truly self-loving and, and really capable of of insight that is that is genuinely helpful and, and kind. It's there, right? We just sometimes have to convince our cli clients that it's worth turning inward. Yes, yes. And I do think that now that myself as a clinician, now that I know that it's there in me, I really believe it. I know it. <laughs> I can yeah. I can better help my clients believe it because if I didn't believe it and I'm telling them <laughs> Well, you're right. They're not going to believe it either. <laughs> no, you're right. You know, you're making a great point, actually. And it's, it's part of why I have been so dedicated to training clinicians, because I think that we deserve, clinicians deserve to have as much inner peace and confidence and healing as possible so that then we can be, you know, authentically effective and, you know, have 
credibility, you know, when we talk to clients uh, about what you just said, about inviting them to trust that wisdom. We have to be able to trust our own inner wisdom. You know, I, I think mm -hmm. it's a really valuable point that you're making. Yeah. Well, the truth seems to be for most therapists, it seems like we, we do go into this work with some experience from childhood that makes us really good at helping and taking care of people. And, you know, whether regardless of whether it was a traumatic childhood or one in which the child just had to be very responsible for whatever reason, you know, which we wouldn't normally think of as traumatic, although it can be. I think that that influences a lot of what brings us therapists into becoming therapists. Exactly right. And you know, because, you know, we've talked about this, that it's not a coincidence that we do what we do. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I feel like we're destined to do this work. And, and I agree with you. I think it's very connected to our family of origin experiences. Uh, you know that I'm a little bit in the minority. You may be as well, but I'm in the minority in that I... I had a very safe, loving childhood, but I was the oldest of four kids. And so, as you suggested, there was a lot of responsibility that went with that. And so I was able to gain mastery over, you know, certain skills, being a good listener, being a good mediator, you know, feeling comfortable kind of giving guidance and suggestions and advice because I was the oldest, you know, and I, I felt very responsible in some ways for the well-being of my my younger siblings. So uh, that wasn't a trauma, but it certainly was a formative life experience that I think gave me those skills and and kind of predetermined this destiny of mine, you know, to do the, the work that I'm doing. So very connected to our earlier experiences in life, for sure. Yeah. So that, that theme jumped out at me and in your newest book. Now, I haven't, I'll disclose to everyone who's listening, I haven't finished the book, so I don't have a total picture of what it is. But from what I have started to read, the first thing I noticed was that it was different from your previous two books in that it seems to me more written for a general audience rather than specifically people who've experienced trauma and have self-destructive behaviors. That's right. That's right. So um, the first book really was really for clinicians treating self-destructive behavior. The second book is a workbook and, and that is a, a kind of a self-help book for clients to either use with their therapists or on their own. But you're right to suggest that the theme there is still very connected to the inevitable byproducts of trauma, which often leads people to do self-destructive things as a way to you know, manage their emotions and, and to do um, self-soothing. This book really is a bit of a departure and in some ways between you and me was more fun to write mm. because it's not really uh, just, it's not just about trauma and it's not just about um, you know, any act of self-harm. It's really written for anyone and everyone. And in fact, you know, when we were designing the cover and I, I knew I wanted the title to relate to Ruby Slippers, as you can imagine, the image that I kept getting from the graphic designer was a pair of, you know, high heeled Ruby Slippers. And my concern with that was that I thought that that message would kind of instantly say, this is a book for women, mm -hmm. right? You know, you see, you see a pair of high heel shoes on a cover and I think it's reasonable that most men would pass that book by. So the reason why we went with the, the Ruby sneakers <laughs> is because I really wanted to make sure that, that the message, you know, whether it was subliminally or more overtly, but I wanted the message to get out there that this is a book for everyone. It's a book for teenagers and adults, for men and for women. And it's a book that anybody can benefit from. I, I've been really humbled and really thrilled by the feedback. The book's only been out a very short time, but we're getting just really beautiful reviews on Amazon and other places. And what I love is that people are saying, this is a book for everyone, that, that no matter where you are in your life, there is a chapter or chapters in here that will speak to you and that will help you to really just continue to move forward in your life. So it's not, it doesn't have to be specific to healing from trauma. I just, you know, the theme of this book is just how to continue to self-actualize and how to continue to strengthen being able to talk to yourself with kindness and, and, you know, not living from a place of guilt or shame, being, becoming more mindful of the messages that you give to yourself about yourself. Cause I think that's such a, you know, a pivotal force in, in all of the subsequent emotions and behavioral choices that we make. Um, there are different sections to the book. So the first book talks about overcoming obstacles because they, I think all of us 
again, regardless of where we've come from, you know, do get confronted with different obstacles in our lives, whether it's in, within a relationship or within a workplace or within ourselves. And so, you know, there's a focus on looking at those obstacles and learning how to navigate those obstacles in ways that empower you and reminding you that you, it's okay to, to reach out. It's okay to ask for help. In fact, that's a sign of strength rather than a weakness that oftentimes in life we get confronted with what I call brick walls. And, you know, people spend a lot of time trying to move brick walls. And, and I've always believed that, you know, when you try to move a brick wall, all that happens is you get a concussion. You don't move the wall. So it's, it's giving people permission to both recognize what those potential obstacles are in their lives and then understanding that the, that the answer is not to keep expanding energy, sort of feudal energy, trying to move you know, something that you can't fix or change, but, but rather to make a, a different life choice and decide, you know what, that is no longer acceptable to me or I'm going to I'm going to turn in a different direction. I'm going to, I'm going to walk somewhere else. So it's just helping people kind of navigate those obstacles in, in ways that I think are far more effective. So that's the first part of the book. The second part of the book is about relationships because, you know, most of us are in a variety of relationships. And I think this is very connected to not giving away your power, understanding what you're able to, to do in a relationship and what you're not able to do. And, and I think what we're not able to ever do is fix or change another person. And so, you know, a lot of the chapters kind of impart that message that the only person you ever have the power to change is yourself. And so it's just kind of giving people permission again to step away from wanting to fix or change someone else. There are chapters that do speak to trauma survivors. And one of the messages I've been giving my clients for years and I'm, I'm sure you've seen this in your work as well, is a lot of trauma survivors think that unless they get an apology from their abuser, that they're not going to be able to heal. Is that something that you confront as a clinician? If you get down to it, they'll say, all I want is for the person to acknowledge what they did and apologize. And of course, that's probably the one thing that most abusers are never going to do. Exactly. Exactly. And I think people underestimate the extent to which that actually holds them hostage and really kind of puts a glass ceiling on the extent to which they can heal. And when you think about it, it's like it's a perpetuation of continuing to turn their power over to the abuser. You know, so the idea that I really can't fully heal until my abuser apologizes, that paradigm really gives the abuser once again the power and the control. So that chapter does talk about, you know, helping people to begin to slowly let go of that idea and to realize that if they don't need an apology or the cooperation uh, or, or anything else, frankly, from an abuser in, in order for them to continue to move forward in, in their healing journey. Um, so that's a piece of what the relationship section is about. And then the third section is something that I I do, you know, pretty much every week in my work as a therapist, and I know that you do as well, and that is really trying to empower clients to be more in the present moment, and whether that comes about through really understanding what it is that they have to be grateful for in the present, making decisions in their lives from, from the current reality of their life, rather than how things used to be or how they think potentially things could be. That's something that I see a lot with um, women in particular who are in very unfulfilling relationships. And what they'll often say to me is, but you know, he, he used to be so loving and so attentive. And that's why they hang in there, right? Because of how it used to be. Or they'll say to me, you know, I just, I know that if he could just get his act together, you know, he could be so loving and so attentive. So I'm just going to hang in there because I think he has so much potential, Right. And the reality is, is that in the present, it's not fulfilling and they're suffering tremendously. So that's a chapter a lot of people have told me that really, really speaks to them because it's not something that we're necessarily consciously aware of. But I think an awful lot of people do often make decisions from the past or the future. And so this is really kind of empowering people to look at their present circumstance and and to find the courage to make decisions, you know, from from that place, you know, instead of what was or or what they imagine or hope will be or could be. And then the fourth unit is about growth and change, because obviously that's what therapy is all about. And I think that's what a good self-help should be. Book should be about, you know, I want people to read this book and, and say, you know, I learned stuff and I 
I feel like I'm beginning to take baby steps in the direction of changing something in my life that's now making me feel either more empowered or or taking away some of my suffering or um, helping me to recognize some of my strengths that perhaps I wasn't as, as tuned into before. So it's it's really it's being willing to to take those growth steps. And and for me, one of the more important chapters in, in that unit is a mantra that I've said to my clients, you know, for forever, which is be afraid and do it anyway. Because uh, I'm sure you see this in your work as well, that so many people really operate from the core belief that says, I'm afraid, therefore I can't. Mm-hmm. Right. So this is about, you know, being afraid, first of all, is a normal human emotion. And uh, it, it's important. There may be very valuable information in that fear. And so I'm not in any way advocating that we minimize or we ignore the fear. We really have to look at the fear. And sometimes it's about just bringing comfort to the fear. Sometimes, you know, the fear is, is saying to us, you know what, I'm not resourced enough, or maybe this is not going to be a safe decision for me. So we definitely want to understand the fear and we, and we want to you know, make sense out of the fear. And having said all of that, I never believe that fear is something that should then be translated into, therefore I can't. So that chapter about be afraid and do it anyway, I I think can be really empowering for for people to read. And then the last chapter, which in some ways for me maybe is the most important, is is really about how to strengthen and grow and access self-compassion. Because I really believe that self-compassion and curiosity are the antidotes to shame. And you know that so many, you know, live their lives from a place of shame and it it, it can just so hold them back. Um, And so when we can bring self-compassion and curiosity to, you know, our thoughts, our feelings and the choices that we make in life, I think that completely sets us free. And it really enables us to talk to ourselves in, in ways that are much, much kinder. Um, I don't know if this is something you encounter a lot, but but I really think, and this is not just within clients, I think this is really cultural, I think this is almost universal, that people believe that they can be motivated through shame. That if I just bully myself enough, if I yell at myself enough, that'll motivate me, you know, to do the things that I know I need to do for myself. Yeah, that really seems to be something in our culture, at least here in the U.S. and, you know, probably everywhere. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, I have this theory that I think a lot of that has its roots in um, sports for kids when they're very young. That coaches, I mean, will often, you know, very openly belittle a kid on the on the field, you know, yelling at a kid, telling, you know, what are you doing? Run faster. You know, um, you know, you just dropped the ball. Look what you're doing. And and I think, unfortunately, a lot of parents sit on the sidelines and don't intervene. Um, and so there's a side of kind of silent collusion around, OK, I, I accept the idea that my kid's only going to be a better athlete if you if you shame him. In essence, I mean, that's really what it is. And I just think, and I've you know seen this in 33 years as a therapist, that I just don't believe that we're ever, ever motivated by shame. I think ultimately it holds us back. And so I'm very passionate about trying to make people both aware of how they talk to themselves about themselves, to really notice the extent to which they're using shaming, bullying, um, judgment, criticism, perfectionism. You know, what's the extent to which they're using those things in their lives in the hopes that that's going to somehow motivate them and then to really teach them how to shift that thinking into thinking that is much kinder and gentler and more compassionate because I think that's ultimately what enables us to move forward. I think that if we truly love ourselves, you know, the sky's the limit in terms of the the healthy risks that we can take and the good choices that we make and um, our threshold for what is and is not acceptable, you know, in relationships and in the workplace, all of that flows from ultimately how we feel about ourselves and how we talk to ourselves about ourselves. So that part of the book to me is really important because I, I want people to, to be more consciously aware of how they talk to themselves and, and what they can do to uh, enhance their, their sense of, of self-love and self-care. I, I love what you're saying. I feel like there is no way to overstate just how crucial self-compassion is and how powerful of a, of a practice it is for really increasing self-love and self-worth. It's incredible. Yeah. And you know, it, it, we are, I think, still a little bit salmon swimming upstream, as I like to say, because 
oftentimes people equate, you know, self-love, self-care, self-compassion with being selfish, Mm -hmm. you know, and I think that too is kind of a cultural norm or just, you know, a mindset. And so I I think it is important that, you know, people like you, people like me do continue to promote this idea that we're not talking about being selfish, but we are talking about taking the time to be kind to yourself, because the more you can do that, the more I think that becomes externalized and the more we're able to do that, you know, for other people and, and to other people in our lives. I really believe that we can only love others ultimately to the extent to which that we love ourselves. I agree with you 100%. And I truly believe that if everyone practiced self-compassion, our world would be a totally different place. We wouldn't have war. Uh, you're right. That is the truth. You know, the whole the whole empathy quotient would dramatically increase. And, you know, where there's empathy, it means that people are kind to each other. And, and people think before they say certain things. And they think before they act. And they actually take a moment to ask themselves, what impact is what I'm about to say going to have on that person? You know, if we all if we all took those five seconds to ask that question before we said what we said to our children, to our spouses, to our significant others, to our employees, it would be a different world. You're totally right. Yeah, I'm so glad. And I know you use self-compassion in your work to great benefit to your clients and, and in all the people you teach. I think it's so powerful. I'm, I'm really glad you included that in the book. Yeah, yeah, me too. And, and again, that's why I'm saying this is a book for everyone, you know, because we all need that practice and we all do need to pay attention to how we talk to ourselves about ourselves. I, I even though I know this is, you know, a, a big statement to make, I really think there's nothing more important than the way we talk to ourselves about ourselves. I think it impacts every facet of our lives. And that tape, uh, you know, is so rooted in family of origin experiences. I know that you, you are a real expert in that and that you really understand that in the work that you do with your clients, that so much of what we see as clinicians has its roots in, in their family of origin experiences. And I think that the way we talk to ourselves, you know, is literally mirroring that that original tape that we got, which was rooted in how our caretakers spoke to us, the messages that they gave us about who we are and how we should feel about ourselves and what we can expect from the world and how we can expect or should expect other people to treat us. You know, all of that is a part of that tape. And, you know, it's it's given to us in, in the most formative part of our development. And as you know, we don't question that tape when, when it's given to us by people that we love and trust. And so even if 90% of the messages on that tape, you know, are dysfunctional or toxic or inaccurate um, or, you know, just filtered through our, the parent's trauma or limitations, the truth is that most people really do not evaluate those messages or reevaluate those messages until they're in a therapist's office. Exactly, because those messages are being taken in by a child's brain so young, three, four, you know, and earlier that isn't capable of that kind of critical analysis of the information and saying, oh, she says I'm bad, but I know I'm not really bad. (laughs) Developmentally, that's impossible. And then it just kind of sticks there. And we, when we look back, you know, I think with a lot of self-reflection and probably what can be done through the processes in this book that we can say, oh, you know, that's not, that's not even my thought. That's something that I was told by someone else. Exactly. I'm really, I love that you use the the term self-reflection because one of the major parts of the book that we haven't, oh, there's my dog. Is that okay? That (laughs) Sure. She weighed in in the last podcast too, as I recall. She she wants to be heard. Yeah. She's got a lot of wisdom, that dog, let me tell you. But I love that you use the term self-reflection because one of the facets of the book that we've not yet touched upon is the fact that with every chapter, there are journaling prompts. There are about six questions that, that the reader gets at the end of each question. And there's actually space within the book itself. It is a sort of a, a combination book and journal sort of diary for people so that they can actually be writing in the book. And those questions are very intentionally designed to create self-reflection and and to invite that inward focus that I alluded to earlier. And you touched on one of kind of, I think, the recurring journal questions that runs through the book, and, and that is continuing to invite the reader to notice whose thought is that? You know, where did you learn that? And have you ever reevaluated it? And perhaps most importantly, does that thought continue to serve you well? And when I say serve you well, for me, it's a very simple 
litmus test. It's does that thought either help your self-esteem or hinder your self-esteem? You know, it kind of gets crystallized down to that. And so every chapter, the reader is invited to, to journal about the chapter, the content of the chapter, but to take that chapter information and really personalize it, you know, really look at how does this relate to me? How does this relate to me? In answering those journaling questions, I think that also kind of moves people forward in their journey, whether it's a journey of healing or it's a journey of increased personal or professional growth or, you know, a journey of enhanced self-actualization or a journey of, of enhanced self-compassion. So um, I, I love journaling. I'm a big fan of journaling. Um, I find I find it kind of funny, you know, with the book coming out, I've been doing a lot of, uh, you know, podcasts and interviews on TV and writing articles. And it's really kind of funny. I think you'll appreciate this, that a lot of the younger people who interview me, you know, get very excited about journaling and they talk about it like it's this brand new treatment, <laughs> you know, phenomenon. <laughs> brand new paradigm. And, you know, I've been in the field for 33 years and I always say, you know, journaling was one of the very first things three, 33 years ago, you know, that we had to give people, you know, to encourage them to feel a sense of continuity in between the therapy sessions or to strengthen their, their self insight and, and their awareness. And so certainly journaling is not anything new. It's <laughs> kind of cute though. There's a lot of stuff on YouTube now, you know, about bullet journaling and, and all different, you know, variations of how one can journal. And I mean, I think that's great because I love that there's a whole new generation, you know, of young people who are discovering really the power of journaling and the value of journaling. So this is not anything new by, by any means, but I love that in some ways it's kind of being reintroduced, not only in the mental health field, but again, just to the general population. And I think that's part of why uh, this book, Finding Your Ruby Slippers, you know, resonates for people because people like to journal again. And, I, and I'm thrilled that they do. And I think that this book will really speak to them, you know, around, around that strategy. Yeah. And, you know, I think for those of us who don't find journaling to be a new idea, there can be some association with, uh, oh, you know, yeah, I used to write in my diary when I was 13, but that's like really dumb. And, you know, um, but once we actually start journaling with some prompts, it can be so powerful and really move the emotional process in a direction past what the loop in your head was doing before you started writing, you know? Great, great way to say it. I think you're totally right. And, and I, I, I agree completely that when you are given a, a specific prompt, you know, meaning a specific question, what that helps to do is it focuses your thoughts. Uh, and, and I think when our thoughts are more focused, when we write, I think the writing can be, you know, we can go deeper, first of all, but I think it's also, it's more productive. You know, we can, we can, we can get more out of it. And what I say in the very beginning of the book is you don't have to do this book in any particular order. Uh, each one of these little chapters and they're very, you know, I keep using the word chapters, but they're literally three pages each. And, and it's just, I, I made that decision very consciously. I, you know me, I could have written 50 pages about every time, <laughs> but I very intentionally decided not to do that because what I wanted to do was just kind of put out little, little ideas that I think are words of encouragement, you know, perhaps hopefully words of wisdom, just kind of get you thinking a little bit about it, but then really kind of invite you to take that inward focus and to go to those specific questions and, and kind of take it wherever you then want to take it. And what I say in the preface of the book is you can either just write in short answers, you know, inside the book itself, or what some of my clients have been doing is they've actually purchased a separate journal or notebook and, you know, they're writing for pages and pages. You know, one of, one of the journal prompts, you know, takes them uh, down a road where they'll, they'll write for five or ten pages. So there's no wrong way to do it. It's whatever resonates for each reader. And again, there's no specific order in which you have to read the book. What I tell people to do is go to the table of contents each day and just kind of notice what statement calls to you on any given day. And just focus on that, you know, and, and kind of make that a practice in your life, just to choose one idea and, and sit with it and, and really let it, you know, let it kind of germinate and, and then settle. And it's a book that you could read in a day, truthfully, because it's, it's written in layman's terms. It's a very easy read. I'm told that the voice is very encouraging and compassionate. And that's how I always try to write. But I actually say to people, you know, don't read it in one day, like really savor it. 
really take your time with it and and go to the sections that that speak to you and know that at any given time in your life different sections will speak to you and at any given time in, of your life the same section could speak to you differently you know so i I'm, I'm hoping that it's a resource that people can continue to return to that's fantastic i'm planning on buying like six copies so i can <laughs> loan them to my clients use them myself and so good. on and so on let yeah. all my family members do it <laughs> Good. And I do think, you know, even though this is, you know, a self-help book and it is definitely designed for the general population, uh, it, it is something that I know a lot of my colleagues who are therapists have incorporated into, you know, the therapy sessions. And so, you you know, I know that I'm, I'm assuming a lot of your listeners are, in fact, therapists. And so I think it's it's useful just to put out there that those questions that are woven into the book as journaling prompts certainly can also be a roadmap for clinicians where they can be asking those questions, you know, verbally, and then using those questions as as um, a starting off point for a conversation in in a session, you know. So I, I I think that it certainly has that application as well. Wonderful. Can you say one little bit about journaling? Just I know you are very well versed in neuroscience, and you could probably talk about how journaling helps with processing. And mm -hmm. would you? take a moment to just talk about that real quick before we sure. finish. And I have a feeling you're probably an expert in that too. <laughs> By the fact that you asked the question, <laughs> you know, that you understand that, you know, in, in the world of therapy now, and I, I don't even, I want to say, I don't even think this is exclusive to trauma therapy anymore. I'm hoping that this is kind of, there's a universality to this mm -hmm. in the therapy in general. What we continue to learn and what continues to get reinforced through things like neuroscience and functional MRIs and PET scans is that the more we can be integrating both the left and the right hemispheres of the brain, you know, both in therapy and outside of therapy, the more deeply our clients can process their memories, their emotions, their thoughts, and the more deeply they can install the resourcing that we're giving them. And so we want to always, I think, be thinking as clinicians about what am I bringing into therapy and what am I giving the client to do as homework that can achieve that idea of left and right hemisphere activity. And so when we're writing, you know, we're accessing a certain part of the brain. When I have my clients read their journal entries out loud, we're actually bringing in a different part of the brain. Um, when they're visually reading what they've written, um, we're accessing something else. And so, um, and, and I'll even add this piece that sometimes I encourage my clients in addition to journaling to add drawings, you know, whether it's doodling or a particular image that really kind of accentuates what they've just journaled about. So when we do those things, and, and I'm going to even add another layer, and that is as they journal, I will often invite them to pause and to notice what they feel on their bodies, you know, um, just notice the sensations, kind of do a quick body scan, you know, given what you've just written, given what you've just reread or read out loud. So when we bring in all those different pieces, the writings, the speaking, going to the body, we are really turning on all the different parts of the brain that we know are creating the greatest degree of, of integration and processing and insight um, and compassion. We know that, you know, compassion is is in the insula, it's in the prefrontal cortex. And so we when we get people to think and to write and to journal, we're, we're putting them in the prefrontal cortex, we're putting them in the reasoning part of their brain. So not only is that going to help with the affect regulation so that they don't get flooded or overwhelmed, it's also going to activate empathy and, and compassion and self-compassion. So it is very important that our clients are not just stuck or living in limbic system when they're, where they're in that perpetual state of fight, flight, freeze and just doing survival. We want them to be in the parts of their brain that require more thought, higher reasoning, cause and effect, analysis. And journaling will do that. Journaling will light up that part of the brain. And I think that um, that helps our clients both with affect regulation and also, as I say, to strengthen insight and empathy. Yes, yes. Thank you for explaining that. And it seems just related to what we were talking about before, that when you have a, an inner voice, an inner critic that's based on when you were four years old, accessing those higher brain functions can really show you that that's, that's a child's way of thinking, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that a lot. I think that's a great, great point, Laura. I think, you know, one of the chapters in the book really talks about 
helping people to discern between then versus now, mm-hmm. past versus the present. You know that so many folks, particularly if they have been traumatized, it's almost like they're frozen in the past. So I love what you just said. I, I think it's really wise that you know, when, when people can, can do the journaling and, and can reason and think and gain, glean insight from the more adult and mature part of themselves, that's another great way to help them kind of strengthen the idea that it's not then, it is now. And in the now, they have more choice. They have more control. They, they can make choices. They're not trapped. They don't have to be frozen. So I, I love that idea, you know, what you're suggesting. It's a it's a it's a great reinforcement for people that that reminds them that that they're safer, right? That that, that there's they're empowered and they're safer and they're adult and and they can look at themselves and life through a different lens. Yes, that's so beautiful. Lisa, I am so happy that you have this book out now to really help an even broader range of people than you have in your previous work. I I am so excited for you. And I think this is going to be huge. I just can't wait to see what happens. Thank you. And I'm so grateful to you that you're willing to talk about it and and bring it to your audience. And, you know, my thing at this stage of my life is, is to reach and teach as many people as I can. And, um, and I, you are doing the exact same thing, Laura, it, both as a therapist and, and in this phenomenal podcast that you've been doing for a while now. So, you know, you and I are, are very much on the same path. And I think that we, we have the same passion and we do want to reach and teach as many people as, as we can. So I do, I do have a lot of faith in this book. And I, I, I you know, I, as I said, the feedback has been just so humbling and so beautiful. So is it okay to let people know where they can get yes, the book? Yes, please, we've, please. We've uh, increased their curiosity about it. So um, certainly they can get all my books on Amazon. And I know in some ways that's the absolute easiest place to get it. Um, but I also want to just let people know about my website because there are, in addition to the books, there's a lot of other free resources there. Um, and the, the website is theferrensinstitute.com. And um, they can also access a lot of free resources on the Facebook page, which is the Ference Institute, um, or on LinkedIn. But I do encourage people to visit the Facebook page because there's all my blogs are there, my radio shows are archived there, and we do uh, try to put out a lot of articles and videos and and just free resources for people so that they can you know continue to to grow and, and to heal thank you and i'll put a link to your website in the show notes for this episode and um any therapists who are listening lisa didn't say it but on her website you will find the best trainings for trauma that i've seen so I'm recommending them all the time to everyone. And, you know, you're, you're creating a real army of therapists who are skilled in trauma. That is what we need in this world today. Thank you. I, I, you are, you are one of those people. (laughs) Yeah, I I am thrilled about that. And and I appreciate your mentioning the Institute in Baltimore. We're just getting ready next week. We start our spring semester and we start the trauma certificate programs again. And I think this is my 22nd time teaching the, the trauma program. And it, it, it's so funny. It never gets old. I am excited about it every time I bring something new to it every time. And, um, I love the fact that there are more and more people like you out there doing the work in the way that you're doing it, because that's what I think is really, you know, making a difference in the world. So thank you again for everything that you do to help your clients. Thank you, Lisa. And thanks for being on Therapy Chat today. My pleasure. Thank you to Sunset Lake CBD for sponsoring this week's episode. Use promo code CHAT for 20% off your entire order at sunsetlakecbd.com. Sunset Lake CBD is a farmer-owned small business that shifts craft CBD products directly from their farm outside of Burlington, Vermont to your door. Sunset Lake CBD has something for everyone. They offer tinctures, edibles, salves, and coffee designed to help with sleep, stress, and sore muscles. Sunset Lake CBD customers support regenerative agriculture that preserves the health of the land and creates meaningful employment in the community. Farm workers are paid a living wage and employees own the majority of the company. Remember, use promo code CHAT to get 20% off your entire order at sunsetlakecbd.com. 
And for more information and resources on trauma and healing from trauma, go to www.traumatherapistnetwork.com. Trauma Therapist Network is a community for therapists and a place for anyone to go to learn more about trauma and find resources and connect with help www.traumatherapistnetwork.com. Thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com.